All right, so we're going to be going over talking about malice and annelid worms. So um, kind of follow along looking at your notes um, that you did just yesterday. So uh, mollusks, you probably heard of before and you're pretty familiar with now. They uh, fit into a couple of different groups. And as you could see at the bottom of your dock, I kind of put them into what we call a concept map like we've been talking about. So. Here are the three classes, and you're going to hear them referred to a little bit differently depending upon who's talking about them. So we have the gastropods. Another name for those are what we call the univalves. Uni means one. It has one opening. So they have one shell, you could say. So um, snails and slugs are a great example of that if you remember from your map. And they eat using that radula, which um, we we'll hear a little bit more about in a video. And then we have bivalves, that's the second group. Bi means two, so think of a clam or an oyster. They kind of open and close and they have two sides to them, uh, to their shell. So you're probably familiar with those a little bit more, maybe in your um, appetite or your, your eating, maybe some of you guys have tried uh, clams and oysters before. They use gills to filter food. So gills, remember, um, those will start to sound a little more familiar to us because they're a little bit more complex than what we've been talking about. So um, they will end up using their gills not only to get oxygen, but they will also use them to filter food, which is kind of interesting. Then we have the cephalopods, the squid and the octopuses. These guys use tentacles to grab their food, and I've always felt like they're kind of a miscellaneous group of these three. They seem a little bit different than the other two, but they fit into this group because they fit a lot of the characteristics of them. They don't necessarily have, obviously, that hard shell that you would see on the other two groups, and they have these powerful jaws and tentacles. So most mollusks have what we call an open circulatory system. So when you think of circulatory system, hopefully you think of where the blood flows, right? So in our system, our blood is flowing in what we call a closed system, right? In arteries and veins. So when you talk about these very simple organisms, they don't have those uh, tubes or those vessels. They're just sitting um, kind of in an open system where the blood is in kind of a cavity. So they're pretty simple. When you think of open circulatory system, they just don't have the complexity that humans um, and other organisms with closed circulatory systems would have. So if it is closed, as I said, the blood is in vessels or tubes, which is like us. So these guys don't have that. Now they have these different body plans that we will hear about again a little bit in this video that we're going to watch eventually. But these are the body parts of a mollusk and they're kind of shaded in this picture. So the purple is what we call the visceral mass. And so that's the area that's in the center and it has kind of the, the central organs, the gut, the gills, and these other like main organs. The foot, which is kind of a tan color. Obviously, they don't have like a foot like you and I do, but you can kind of see on each one of those, the snail on the left, the clam in the middle, and the squid on the right. The foot is kind of at the back end or the bottom of it. Then they have the mantle, which is the pink area. I would say that kind of reminds, should remind us a little bit of the like cell membrane of a cell. So it protects that middle section of the body, especially those that don't have shells. So like a squid doesn't really have a shell. You can see a shell on the snail and the clam, but the squid doesn't have one. So it's kind of another protective layer. So the foot, of course, I forgot to mention, it helps them move and it makes mucus that kind of helps them slide along. So that word slug kind of reminds us of that, right? So annelid worms we have to talk about too. Annelid worms are kind of an interesting group. Um, they have segments and we'll kind of go over that a little bit more too. We will be looking at dissecting an earthworm. So um, they have, you'll see in the pictures, the videos that we um, look at, you'll see that they have kind of those identical or repeating parts, right? And uh, earthworms are a great example of that. And they have what's called bilateral symmetry. So you can divide them, the outside of their body, into two equal halves. So think of our body. Our body is also bilateral symmetry. We can divide ourselves right down the middle and we have two even sides. We're not talking about the inside. So remember that. Uh, and they have here, all of a sudden, we're starting to hear about a brain, okay, and a complex nervous system. Now that might not seem like a big deal to us. But we haven't really seen a brain yet in these simple invertebrates, right? 
So uh, that's important to note. Now, annelid worms don't just think of the earthworm. Some live in salt and fresh water. We're going to talk about the groups here. So again, there was a map um, that you can see kind of how this stuff all fits together that you can take a look at. So first we have the earthworms, right? They are obviously pretty uh, common here in Wisconsin. You see them especially after it rains. They have what are called castings. They break down plant and animal matter and deposit it into the soil. So they really help our gardens by making the soil richer. They kind of um, move the soil around and get the nutrients where they need to go. So that's helpful. Then we have what are called marine worms. They are covered with bristles. These guys live in the ocean, so we don't see them around here naturally. And they eat mollusks. So that's kind of interesting that we're talking about both groups. Then we have leeches, which probably are the, what I like to call the grossest of the annelid worms that we talk about. Many of you may be familiar with them for a bad reason. Maybe you've had a leech on you. They like to suck other people's blood. Uh, other animals and people. So there uh, can be scavengers, they can be predators. Now this is interesting, but they actually excrete a chemical that prevents our blood from clotting. So you might think that is disgusting. That's why you bleed if you ever have to pull one off of you from like a lake or something. It is very gross sometimes, but actually, this is kind of crazy to think about, they used to put leeches on people in hospitals, like way back when, when we didn't have the technology and the medications and stuff like that. They actually used to use them to reduce or to bring down swelling, like say someone had like a surgical wound from a surgery or some other type of swelling of, of a part of their body. They would put leeches on them so that they would excrete that chemical into their body and they would bleed. They called it bloodletting. So even in like old movies, sometimes you'll still see that. Now, what's really interesting about this is that today, the medication that we use in the real world for people who might need their blood to be thinned, maybe they have a heart condition, it's actually patented after this chemical that a leech uh, lets into your body. So that's pretty crazy to think about how that, you know, we can use animals like the leech to um, figure out how to help people. And so um, obviously we don't see that in, you know, civilized countries anymore, but um, it's possible that some people still try it. Um, I would not recommend it though. I would say use the modern, you know, medical stuff instead of doing that. But if you get a leech on you, it's not probably going to be anything to worry about. Just get it off of you. All right, let's come back together.